Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pathfinder, presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. I'm your host, Mo Islam, and today we're joined by Matt Gaelic, the co-founder and CEO of Astroforge, a company mining asteroids for platinum. This may be one of the most ambitious projects we've had on the show. Now, before we get into the conversation with Matt, a quick word from our sponsors. Spider Oak's Orbit Secure software is designed for hybrid space operators struggling to manage the chaos of securing data flow and access to and from tens of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit. Using a unique combination of end-to-end zero-trust encryption and blockchain-distributed ledger, Orbit Secure allows your mission to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure hybrid space environments. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero trust security and resiliency to your zero gravity environments, check out Spider Oak at www.spideroak.com. Hey Matt, very excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Hey Mo, thanks for having me on. Of course. So uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna say um, you know of all the uh, you know the first time that we we met and we spoke, there was one thing that was abundantly clear to me. Um, and that's you're the most enthusiastic person I've ever met about asteroids and mining asteroids. <laughs> and I have met a number of people in the space. So I would love to tell me why are you so passionate about this? Yeah, I mean, look, this goes back a long way in my own personal history, Mo. But in short, I love deep space and I love the human need to kind of explore the cosmos. And, um, you know, as we've seen this kind of new space revolution take place, like there's an opportunity now for commercial companies to really take a realistic stab at asteroid mining. Um, and that's what we're going to do at Astroforge, right? It's a really big vision. It's a really big goal, but we wanted to do something in deep space that could benefit the earth and really change humanity. How, you, uh, how, um, uh, when did you start the business? So we started it, um, on the day we started YC, which was January 10th of 2022. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're pretty new. How, how, how big is the company right now? So we just eclipsed 20 people at the company, although I don't think that's really the right size to measure a company at. Sure. I think the better size is to measure it as what we've accomplished. And so really quick to go off it, like we are in space now, right? We launched our first satellite in the middle of April, and that was a refinery that's in low Earth orbit. We launched on Transporter 7. Um, and to follow that up later this year on Intuitive Machines Launch 2, we are going to launch the world's first commercial deep space mission. So we are going to go out and do a flyby of our target asteroid and take some hopefully really nice images of it as we fly by it. All right. So a lot, a lot to deconstruct. So uh, I, I do want to start with what most, I think, folks think about when they think asteroid mining, right? And I think typically uh, most, I, I would say that, you know, when you come across the, the topic of asteroid mining and you think about, you know, sort of commercial viability, it usually feels like it's years and years away. And if you look historically, there's, um, so many examples of failed asteroid mining companies. And there's a lot of reasons why they failed, right? Most have failed because of the high cost of mining or um, the cost of the spacecraft, the cost to launch, um, lack of clear regulations, right? There's a, there's, there's a couple um, relatively famous ones, you know, planetary resources and deep space industries. And, uh, you know, we can, we can go on, but, you know, t- t- tell me a little bit about what has changed and why it makes sense now. Because if it didn't, you wouldn't be doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Right. If it did it, we wouldn't be dedicating all our time to trying to pull this off. Um, I really dedicate or, or, or think of this as as kind of the explorers in the 50s trying to climb Mount Everest. When you go after a big audacious goal, there's going to be lots of dead bodies along the way. Right. Let's just be honest about it. And I think talk about specifically about planetary resources. You know, they got a lot of capital. Um, they had a great team. They made a lot of great progress, but their timing was off. Right. If you look at 2012. If you wanted to go to deep space, if you wanted to go outside of Earth's gravity well, you really had two U.S. rocket choices, Atlas V or Delta IV. Both of those are, you know, $300, $400 million launches you would have to buy. You're not going to fly a cheap satellite if you're spending $400 million on a rocket. You're probably going to spend $400 or $500 million on that vehicle to make sure it's super reliable. And so in order for planetary resources to just copy what we're going to do in Mission 2, you know, they would have to raise close to a billion dollars. This landscape has fundamentally changed at this point, right? SpaceX um, has lowered the cost of launch dramatically. But then we also had the government kind of uh, do the CLIPS missions. And the CLIPS missions gave us a whole bunch of rideshare slots to the moon. For us, that's a whole bunch of extra energy to get outside of Earth's gravity well. And that's what we do. So, you know, our 
launch cost is two orders of magnitude lower than what planetary resources could even consider. Um, and that just gives us a tremendous uh, value proposition to get out in deep space. On top of that, you've seen kind of the new space economy explode. I mean, you have bus manufacturers and there's, there's a ton of them out there, right? Ones like Apex or K2 Space or some of these new startups that are really offering spacecraft at a, at a, a very, very low cost compared to what they were ever offered at before. Yeah, they're going to be a little risky. They're not going to have as much flight heritage as a, as a Boeing or, or Lockheed spacecraft, but we can go take that risk because the launch cost is so much cheaper. And so when we look at all these and put them together, it just makes this a, a totally economically viable way to go out into deep space. On top of that, the U.S. government spent a shitload of money looking at near-Earth asteroids. So we studied a ton of these. And um, Planetary Resources Day, they didn't have, they had a handful of asteroids they could go target. You know, we have the JPL small body database with 1.3 million objects in it now that you can go look at. And we know of quite a bit more than that. Like, so this, this whole field has just exploded in a way that gives us access and gives us uh, accessibility to go do this. And it, it allows the timelines to be really condensed and our capital expenditures to be much, much lower, which means we can easily be commercially viable as an entity. Now, it's still really fucking hard to go mine an asteroid. I'm not going to oversimplify it. Like, we still have a big challenge ahead of us to get out there, to go land on this thing, to mine it and do it. But I also want to give planetary resources and deep space industries a lot of credit for the technology advancements they made along the way. You know, if I use my Everest analogy, like we have much better climbing gear. We got much more technology to go have an attempt to get to the top. It doesn't mean we won't die. But, you know, I think we have a really good chance to hit the summit and actually pull this off. And that's why, you know, me and Jose are spending every waking minute trying to figure out how to get across the line. Can we talk a little bit about your and Jose's backgrounds? And, you know, this is obviously a very um, complex technical challenge. How did you decide that, you know, you two are the right um, right team for the job. First off, we were the only two guys that I think were crazy enough to go do it. But on top of that, uh, I spent a number of years at Virgin Orbit building Launcher One. You know, sad story of that company recently with their bankruptcy, but it was a great team in the early days that really set out to do something uh, kind of crazy, right? Drop a liquid fueled rocket off the wing of a 747. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent about five years there. Jose spent a number of years at SpaceX in the early days working under Hans on Falcon 9 and Dragon capsules. And so, you know, I think we both saw this kind of fundamental change happening in the space industry early. We actually both met each other at Bird Rides, which is the scooter company. We had both kind of got burnt out on working on rockets. Look, you build rockets for a while and they're super cool and they make big fireballs. But after you figure out the technical challenges, they get a little boring and like you're just a manufacturing company. And for us, it wasn't really that cool. So we both ended up at Bird for kind of the same reasons. And it was one of these clear cases, Mo, where about a year at Bird for both of us were like, Hold on, dude, we're making fucking scooters. Like, these are kind of lame. Let's go back to space. And that's what we did. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, let's, uh, let's actually take a quick step back um, and talk basics, right? So how does asteroid mining work? What does it mean to mine asteroids? Uh, this has been conceptually something that has been on the minds of both governments and commercial players, um, like, like we mentioned, for a long, long time. Why do we care? Yeah, I mean, first off, why do we care? We're running out of metals. Like, we're running out of resources. We see this every day. We see this with the cost of resources skyrocketing. We are very focused on what are called the platinum group metals, right? These six elements that are used in pretty much every industrial device you have. They're a major catalyst. I mean, they're in your catalytic converter in your car. They're emission reduction. Um, and the way we mine them now currently is we dig big assholes in the ground, uh, usually in third world countries that don't have great labor laws. Uh, we take advantage of the population. We destroy the planet. And we get uh, little specks of platinum out of them. And then we go sell it on the spot market, right? Um, and almost all of this as a, as a base is, is really controlled by Russia or China. In fact, the U.S. has very, very limited platinum group metal or reserves uh, within our borders. So we have a major problem that is going to hit us in the future. You know, the quality of ore in platinum group mines is going to have by 2050. And I think we all see this uh, coming up. And the only way to solve it at this point is to go off world. Like we have explored all the easy ore sources. We've done a ton of studies of the earth. We're kind of out of it. At some point, human species is going to have to go to the universe and mine it if we want to continue our way of life. You know, we need to maintain that economic growth rate we have. That's what we're going to go do at Asher Forge. So what, how, do you, um, how do you think about, you know, the, the types of asteroids, right? Like uh, there's... There's clearly tons of asteroids in our solar system. 
They're all in various areas. They're all various sizes. They're all um, made of different materials. Um, how do you think about the types of asteroids and going after them? And you know what's viable? Yeah, I mean, look, as a human species, we've had a, a ton of scientific missions out to asteroids that I'm sure scientists care a lot about, made out of organic compounds or stones or whatever. We don't care about any of them. We care about what are called the M-type or metallic asteroids. These are primarily going to be between 95 and 90 percent iron, have other traces of metal. But, um, you know, we did a big study on the meteorites that hit the Earth. Keep in mind, asteroids hit the Earth all the time. We just call them meteorites. Uh, so we have a ton of these M-type um, examples on the Earth. And we can go study them. And, you know, they have up to 1% platinum group metals by mass on them. That is what we are going after. Uh, we really don't care about anything else. Now, on top of that, we're not going after asteroids in the asteroid belt. So if you watch a show like The Expanse, you know, they sent out like these trillion dollar ships and they go way out there and it takes forever. And you have these belters and all of this. That's not really what's going to happen in our opinion. We're going after what are called near-Earth asteroids. They're pretty damn close to Earth. We go out to them. We refine them on site. So we actually refine the asteroid regolith into the platinum group metals on the asteroid surface. And then we ship it back to Earth and do a direct insertion back into Earth and recover the metals. So it's a pretty simple process. It's a pretty small vehicle we're going to use. And it's a pretty low-cost way to go attempt to mine an asteroid. How close are you know, near-Earth um, asteroids? You know, they're always in, they're going to be in heliocentric orbit. So they're going to be in orbit around the sun. So you really have to go based off timing. Um, sure. You know, a lot of these have come closer than the moon to us at certain points. Now, they're not there anymore. And on average, when we really look at our target list and what we're going away, uh, they're going to be anywhere between 5 and 12 million miles away from Earth. What's the level? Uh, so in terms of the platinum group metals, uh, how many of those or Actually, let me ask it differently. Uh, how... Um, how plentiful are those types of asteroids in your Earth orbit? We believe they're anywhere between 3 and 5%. So now a lot of this is based off theory. A lot of really scientific people that are way smarter than me that write these really cool papers that I just copy numbers out of, right? At the end of the day, we have never taken a high-resolution image of an M-type asteroid. The first mission that is going to go do this is the Psyche mission. It's going out to an asteroid called Psyche 16. That's going to give us a lot of confirmation for our models as we go forward on, on whether or not this is a pure M-type or not. But this is still has a lot of risk associated with the asteroid selection itself. Um, we have identified really five potential targets that we have very, very high confidence are going to be these M-type asteroids with that percentage of platinum. We have a little bit bigger list of other potentials that we need more data on, and we're working with giant telescopes to actually go take images of these. The hard part here is most like, these things are really fucking small. You know, we're talking between anywhere from really from 20 meters up to about 300 meters. They're very hard to image from Earth. You need big telescopes um, and you have to take a lot of images to even get pictures of them. So they're tiny objects in the solar system that we're going after. So there's been a couple of fairly high profile government missions to asteroids um, recently, right? Uh, there was DART, which, you know, I know everyone, there was a huge um, following around that mission because it was, it was, you know, it was exciting. We're going to smash a spacecraft into an asteroid and see if we can change the trajectory. Uh, now that isn't, a, that's not exactly what you're doing here, right? Um, I probably, a, a better Hopefully comp not. is, <laughs> exactly. Uh, probably a better comp is the Ayabusa uh, mission, um, Japan, which I believe was in 2000, early 2000, 2003, um, I think. And then there was the Osiris mission by NASA in 2016, those feel a little bit more in line with, you know, what you're doing at Astroforge. I mean, can you talk about the, those two missions and why yeah, the so government we, were, you know, why they, you know, why Japan and, and NASA, um, you know, did that? I mean, they did it because it's fucking cool, right? They also did it because it is really the only way trajectory wise to return something from another planetary body. Like we're talking about Mars sample return mission. You're seeing the costs already get outrageous, right? It's like estimated to be $10 billion or something. Why? Cause it's kind of hard to leave Mars once you land on it. Um, you know, the, the asteroids are a lot easier to get back from. So Hayabusa one and two went out, took samples of asteroid, brought them back. Those were great. Those were organic compound asteroids. I forget the exact type. Bennu went to a C or Bennu was where Osiris Rex went. It was a C type asteroid that they took a sample from. Both of them made huge scientific discoveries on what, is, what, what the is, concentration. What is C type? What is C type? C type stands for carbonaceous type uh -huh. asteroid. Um, to be honest with you, that's about my limage of those type of asteroids, because as soon as I read that, I just stop reading about them because for us, we don't care. Um, but, uh, you know, when they went to Bennu, they found out it was just a rubble pile in space. It was actually a massive discovery uh, for the science team there. And that that sample will return in September and be analyzed by NASA. So there's been a lot of progress. 
what those missions really did for us was show us that it is technically possible to get to an asteroid, land on it, grab some of the regolith, and bring it back to Earth. Like We know this can all be done, right? Really, Astroforge's whole game plan here is, cool, can we just do that for a commercially viable cost, right? I really liken us to kind of the early days of SpaceX when Elon said, why the fuck am I spending $400 million for a Delta IV? Like, this is way too much money. Can I just go build this? That's essentially we're doing the exact same thing. Can we just go make this cheaper? It's a very economical business way to go do it. The DART mission was actually hugely beneficial for us, even though it wasn't, you know, they didn't land on it. It gave us a whole bunch of algorithms to do localized navigation to the asteroid. Now, they smacked into it, but we want to land on it, so we need to slow down a little more. But they published all of that. And the spacecraft was a much smaller spacecraft, much cheaper spacecraft that got there. Um, so it gave us a lot of advantages to actually start lowering that cost dramatically right away. And we've rolled a lot of those learnings into our mission two and three vehicle that we're designing now. Right. So let, let's actually let's talk a little bit more about your technology. So what exactly are you building um, and how does it work? We build the refinery, number one. So that's what we have to build first. Like we have to make a method to process an M-type asteroid into platinum group metals. So input in a solid metallic surface, output platinum. Mm -hmm. um, that is what we launched in April, and that's probably the biggest development at the company. Other than that, we don't want to develop anything. That's it. We want to buy everything else. Now, the reality is as soon as you go shopping for uh, deep space hardware, anybody's going to find out very quickly, well, a lot of this shit doesn't exist to buy, and you either have to design it yourself or go do it. So Number one is the software suites themselves. Like we have to design the trajectories and the GNC to get there, land on it, do all the proximity operations. Um, we could buy some of it, but we had to design a lot of it. And then when it came to the camera selection, there was nothing available that was in our price range that we could actually buy. So we had to develop in-house. We have a 20 megapixel imager um, that allows us to do image processing on the fly on the cameras themselves. Uh, we had to build that in-house just because it wasn't available. But other than that, well, you know, our real plan is to be horizontally integrated. I don't want to build anything. If I have to build a satellite bus, I just have to buy a bigger team. If I got to build a software suite to manage all this stuff, I just have to, you know, get a bigger team. We want to keep this company small and nimble. And that's our plan. Well, so, so uh, what, what's, what's the purpose? So uh, as far as, um, or I guess what it sounds like is you, when you land on an asteroid, you want to actually do the refining on the asteroid. And is that because the payload that you're actually bringing back to Earth is more directly uh, sellable, right? So you're not bringing back, um, you know, pieces of rock that might actually not be worth anything. I just, um, the reality is if you do the math, uh, you can't. So, you know, I know that there's been a lot of talk about like going to an asteroid and bringing an asteroid back to low Earth, low Earth orbit or to lunar orbit. And um, I'm sorry, but if you do some like basic first order transfers, like it doesn't make any sense. You'd have to build a gigantic ship with so much Delta V to do this. Uh, it's just not realistic. We simply have to refine because I don't want to bring back all of that asteroid bits back to Earth. Like, it's just not economically feasible for us to do it the size craft we have. It's an economics problem, not, not a want. Trust me, it's a lot easier to refine this shit on the Earth than it is in space. I wish sure. we could, but physics do, got in the way. For, for the benefit of the audience, can we talk about what it means to refine? Uh, you know, so, you, so you're landing on... You know, I, I kind of have to assume we're talking, you know, the, you know, clearly our audience is uh, more informed about space and the industry than most. But, you know, asteroid mining is definitely one of those areas of the market that aren't, I, I don't think is talked about nearly as much um, uh, commercially, right? Because, you know, it is still such a technical issue, a technical problem, and, and, and no one has been able to really achieve it commercially. So if, if we were to just uh, talk 101, so like, you know, what does it mean to refine, you know, you're going on an asteroid you're digging, right? You're digging into the asteroid, you're extracting some type of material, and then you're refining, you're refining it, hoping that the end product is platinum, right? In your case. Yeah, I mean, so we are going after these M-type asteroids, which we believe are going to be cohesive metal balls in space. Imagine a BB that's 100 meters in diameter uh, mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of like crater impacts on it. That's essentially what we're going after, right? You simply land on it, a technique that we've learned about from some previous companies on how to do this, which I won't get into the details of. Um, we heat up the surface, we turn it into a vapor. And once you have all of those metallic particles in vapor form, you can use magnets to separate them out. And that's simply what we do. So mm -hmm. that's my really like high level explanation of it. Obviously, there's sure. a lot more nuance and detail to it. 
But just to give you a sense, like we have this working in our lab now. I can show you, um, and it's in space now as well, right? We, we have this process down. We understand how to do the refining. And um, we're currently spending all our time optimizing it to make sure it's as power efficient as possible. What is... What do you have in space currently? So yeah, you said the first mission. The first mission of the company was in April, Transporter Seven. Um, yep. So you, what did you, what exactly did you launch in to space, and what did it demonstrate? So we sent our refinery with a piece of what I'm going to call artificial asteroid, okay. i.e., um, we heated up some metal and we made an asteroid. What we expected the concentrations to be when we land. So we sent that up, and we are going to process it in space. Essentially, do that process I just talked about. And using what's called XRF, so we take x-rays of it to get data back, we will show that we were able to separate the platinum group metals from all of the other iron and other things on it that we don't care about. Um, and that's the goal of that whole mission that we sent up. So it's a small 6U CubeSat that's in orbit now, getting ready to do those experiments. Okay. And and uh, is there a, uh, you alluded to this, there's another mission coming up in, in uh, later, later this year. Um, how does that relate to the current mission? It doesn't at all. So the current mission was to prove out the refinery. The second mission is really, I think, the big question. And to be clear, it's actually the one that excites me the most. It is the real question of, cool, dude, like, can you get to a fucking asteroid? That's what we're going to go do. We're going to go show the world that, yeah, you can. For the price we're talking about as a rideshare partner on a lunar mission, we can go get to a fucking asteroid. And we're going to go do a flyby of our target asteroid and take those high resolution images, those 20 megapixel images of it. So Hopefully next time we talk, Mo, behind me, you're going to see this, like, not this artist drawing of an asteroid, but a real fucking picture of an asteroid. <laughs> uh, that's going to be pretty sick. So that's what we're going after. What is the, uh, so has, has, have you started the refining process on, on uh, mission one? Or uh, is that kind of to be, to be done at, at a later date? It's still to be done. We're still working with the spacecraft to bring it up. Everything is healthy on the vehicle. But these things, I mean, anybody that's done space ops in sure. the way we're doing them, no. It just takes a really fucking long time, much longer than as a CEO of a company you would like it to take. Uh, right. But Jose and, and the technical team are working on that every day to make sure it's going in the very constrained, very slow process so that we get it right the first time. Um, you know, it's how it works in space. I, I wish it was faster, but it's not. So, so um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, part of why Astroforge is able to exist today at the cost structure it, you're doing business in has been sort of the work of all the you know, companies like Deep Space and Planetary Resources and a lot of the government right um, work, science and exploration work that's taken place so far. How much of your existing technology would you say um, is uh, you know, fundamentally based on those um, you know, prior technologies and how much, how much of it do you feel like is unique and unique enough that you feel like, you know, Astro is a moat, right? So it's not, um, you know, any other smart engineer who's like, okay, well, this tech exists, I can come and, you know, build a quick team out of it. You know, I don't really need to vertically, vertically integrate um, a good chunk of my business. And, you know, um, I can, I can, I can also do this. Right. So I, maybe talk a little bit. I'm being Brian very long winded, but the question is about a moat. <laughs> Brian, your yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, we, a lot of people ask me this question and the reality is, is that Astroforge like, we didn't invent any of this. We didn't invent the math. We didn't invent the materials. I mean, you know, we work with so many new space companies. I mean, our software testing is run by Epsilon 3, right? You, you work with other companies to go bring up components and spacecraft and all of this. Like, there's not a reason to go really build these big technical moats on, on the hardware side. Um, the only thing we really have a moat for, I would say we have two moats as a company. Number one is the refinery. Now, the concept and overall understanding of refinery, I think, is very well understood. Like, we didn't invent the physics behind it. But actually building a spacecraft around that and the mechanical fixturing and how to do that in the orifice size is like, that takes a really fucking long time to figure out. It takes a lot of math. It takes a lot of experimentation. And we've achieved that. So that's moat number one. Moat number two is the deep space trajectories themselves. Sure, you can go work with JPL and you can download Monty or you can go use, you know, some of these other tools out there to go do this. Um, it's still really fucking hard to figure out. It still takes a long time to make sure your models are correct. And like, we won't even be able to say we're for sure until we go do it. And that's why this mission is so important. Mo is like, we have to prove out that we are able to do what, what JPL does on a daily basis for a fraction of the cost with a commercial team without access to all that government software. Right. Um, that's a tricky thing. And it takes a lot of math and a lot of buildup and a, and a, and a gigantic software suite we have running now to make that happen. Right. What are, what are now, you know, um, the space is hard. Uh, that's not something that any, any of us or anyone listening is surprised by or that statement. 
but what are sort of the risks that you're worried that you that worry you right that keep you up at night that you're like hey um you know uh you know i'm sure there's a million different things that could potentially go wrong but what are the what are the items that you're like hey this is something that it's going to take a little bit of time to solve for um and you know um, or, or 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 maybe maybe you've kind of identified most of those kind of you know call it catastrophic scenarios and you have to like clear game plans for them yeah, look, we know this is really fucking hard, and it's already hard to go to low Earth orbit and launch on a transporter mission. Now imagine doing that to deep space. This is really, really fucking challenging. And if I stayed up every night worried about all the risks, like I would get no sleep. That's the honest truth. Uh, the reality is, Mo, if you're going to take on a company like this, like you got to be able to to deal with it. You got to be able to play the big game and see if it's going to work out. And I think all of what we have we have a great investment team that really is behind us, and I've been very open with. This is an all or nothing company that's high risk, high reward. If you're looking at this for a 10x return, like don't invest, right? We are not a B2B SaaS company that's going to have constant returns. Like we're either going to mine the fucking universe or we're going to go bankrupt. Those are our two options. Um, <laughs> do you want to join us, right? Like that's how it yeah. works. And I mean, having those kind of people be- behind us and, and really having just so much support from the space community as a whole. I mean, everybody we've talked to in, in LA has just been super helpful and is like, this is an awesome mission. How can we help you guys out? How can this happen? So I don't even want to pretend like it's just me and Jose leading this whole charge. It really is almost becoming a, a space community, both from the governmental side when it comes to working with advisors at, at NASA and JPL, all the way down to the commercial startups that you see happening all over LA. Um, I think this is going to be a big kind of, space effort and if we can pull it off um i think we're really going to change the landscape of every space company out there as we go forward yeah i think there's no doubt i think if you guys are able to pr- uh, prove out uh you know commercial liability or an asteroid mining i mean this is something that you know if you look at any investors sort of like spectrum of risk or or, or uh or category of investing it's typically in the sci-fi category right? it's something farther out it's you know tends to be higher risk by nature of, of what it is and, and you know the um, uh, the the unprovenness side of you know the the commercial operations, but so so I completely agree with you, and, and you're right in that that's the, you know you need that type of you know go big or go home attitude to be able to pull off something like this as ambitious as this. So uh, 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 yeah, it totally makes sense to me. Now um, Matt, uh, we have to take a quick break. Uh, there's a lot we talked about, but there's still a lot left we do have to talk, which is like the business case of the, of the company, and I'm. Uh, excited to dig into that so just stay with us for just a couple seconds and we'll be right back space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. to quote the commander of the u.s space forces operations command cyber threats are unfortunately the soft underbelly of our global space networks spider oak the leader in space cybersecurity software is dedicated to providing space operators with the solutions they need to protect hybrid space systems Their Orbit Secure software uses a unique combination of end-to-end zero-trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, allowing missions to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure LEO and hybrid space systems. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero-trust security and resiliency to your zero-gravity environments, check out SpiderOak at www.spideroak.com. Matt, welcome back. So... Let's talk a bit about the economics of asteroid mining, right? Uh, you know, you, you, you started with uh, platinum, right? Platinum brute metals, you mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a, 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 a material that you very uh, clearly chose for good reason. So maybe let's talk about that. Uh, why did you choose that? Um, how much does it sell for in, on Earth? Um, you know, is it just not that abundant here or is it just so expensive that it's worth even mining off world. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about platinum group metals as a whole. So $60 billion worth of them were consumed in industrial applications last year worldwide. Uh, It's a fairly big market cap. Uh, It's a fairly well understood market cap. It is a commodity, right? It is sold as a, as a spot price. It changes twice a day, according to London, which is a whole different ballgame I don't understand at all, and I don't ever want to. But essentially, platinum group metals range anywhere from 400 bucks an ounce up to about $20,000 an ounce in today's prices, depending on which element we're talking about. We have expected concentrations that we expect to get out of specific asteroids and what that breakdown will be. Um, but yeah, it is a very, very rare element. It is not found in high quantities on Earth. In fact, one of the leading theories for why it even exists in ore mines are from asteroid impacts. 
We do think that the core of the Earth is very high in platinum group metals during, during the, its formation. That's where they all went. They sunk to the core. Um, obviously, we can't access it, so it's a theory, and it'll be a while before we prove it. Essentially, what we think these M-type asteroids are as we're going after is the core of a broken up planet. So that's mm-hmm. essentially what we're trying to mine as the core of a planet. And I think it was a little bit easier for us to figure out how to go up than to drill down. So that's what we're trying to do. Now, the costs of these across the board for one of our missions to talk about some details about how we're thinking about this. I get asked this all the time. Well, when you bring back platinum, are you going to destroy the platinum economy? Which, by the way, is really fucking cool when you're pitching a company and like investors think you're going to destroy the world's economy, um, number one. But number two is we're not going to do that. Our spacecraft are very small. They don't bring back a, you know, they're bringing back about uh, anywhere from one to 2,000 kilograms per mission, depending on where we go and some of the trajectory optimizations that we have to go through. So you can see on average, this is between, you know, 70 to about $140 million in return mass per mission that we would bring back. So we're not talking about bringing back a trillion dollars worth of platinum group metals at once. We're talking about bringing back a a very, very small amount and uh, on a very small vehicle and doing this multiple times to allow us to really get up to the market potential we want or the elasticity of platinum per year. So that's how we're thinking about the business case for asteroid mining long term and and why we chose platinum to go after. So uh, we said one to two thousand kilograms of iron drain. How, yep. how long? How long does that take? How long does it take once you've landed on an asteroid to to, to mine that type of um, or, or that much? How, how long have you guys estimated? Yeah, it really has to do with the concentration on the specific asteroid, and anywhere it takes between one to three months to refine that out. Okay, um, and then the spacecraft is is, is clearly well suited to 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 stay on the asteroid for much longer than that, right? If need be. I mean, keep in mind, like our, our imagers that we just went through radiation testing, and we actually just wrapped up a big test campaign on them for deep space. Like they're going to be built to handle about 20 years in deep space. We are estimating each one of these missions will be less than two years. And almost all our trajectories confirm that for specific launch dates. Now, keep in mind, anybody that's dealt with actually doing orbital you know, dynamics of deep space missions, like a launch date is so fucking important that realistically, this can change dramatically based on when we leave the Earth. But for an average way to look at this, it's a two-year total mission. So, so, so two things we actually haven't talked about. One, which is, uh, you know, you're on sort of a transfer mission or, or a rideshare mission. SpaceX drops off your spacecraft. How are you getting to the asteroid ultimately? Are, are you going to have prop systems um, on the on your spacecraft itself? Absolutely. I mean, we have to provide a, a lot of Delta V for these vehicles to get out there. Right. And obviously, for, for those that don't know, Delta V is how we really measure in deep space kind of how much uh, the vehicle, it's how much the vehicle can change its velocity to be technical, but it's how much you know power the vehicle has to, to change where it's going. So we get dropped off from the Falcon 9. We'll fire our thrusters, get out to the asteroid, obviously do a counter burn to slow down, land on it, collect our platinum. Um, and then leaving actually is not a lot of power to do. It's very, very minimal delta V. We kind of do a ballistic trajectory back at the Earth, and then we use the arrow braking technique to slow us down so we can land. Got it. Okay. So you, you, you're, uh, the, the spacecraft itself will be um, fully capable of returning back to Earth, right, without any... Yes, you're not docking with any other kind of mechanism or return vehicle like the spacecraft. No, itself. keep in mind, like we we can't actually dock because we cannot. Like just to be clear, the the trajectory doesn't work where we can slow down enough to go into low Earth orbit. Okay. I don't have the fuel to do it. Um, the nicest thing about us doing a, a return is that uh, it's just fucking metal. We don't have people. We don't have really any scientific instruments. We just have metal. So it means we can handle a lot more heat, a lot higher environments than really pretty much any other reentry craft and be a lot rougher about it. So kind of makes reentry, uh, it makes it a lot less challenging for us than I think it, it has been for a lot of other people. Um, something, you know, we'll, we'll do with a lot of metal and see how it goes. So, so the mission later this year is the big one, right? So that one will pretty much prove um, the, you know, the technology and that it works. How, how it, the mission later this year is only going to prove that we can get to the fucking asteroid. Oh, I that see. all okay. of our systems work on it, but it is a flyby mission where we are taking images. So it'll prove out the navigation to get to it, local navigation that would get in preparation for landing. The imagers are successful in operation, and then we'll actually continue that mission for two more years into deep space to just radiation test the vehicle in a realistic situation. When will the, so, so maybe actually without me assuming, what is, what are sort of the next few missions look like post that mission? 
yeah, so I haven't really gone into detail publicly about Mission 3 and 4. We're going to be releasing some information on them in the October okay. timeframe of this year. So be on the lookout for that, Mo, but I really don't want to dive into the details sure. of those missions. All right, well, we will be waiting for that. Uh, uh, so so let, let's then maybe talk about um, kind of scaling plans, right? Uh, let's kind of fast forward to, to your next couple of missions. You've landed on an asteroid. You refined material. You're bringing it back. It's worked. It's worked. Right. Where do you go from there? How do you think about, um, you know, scaling the business from there? And, and, you know, how do you think about plans? Is it, you know, continue focusing on plan them, other metals that you're thinking about? Uh, you know, how do you think about the business for the next couple of few years? Yeah. So, so near term, when we say near term, I'll say after a successful uh, mining mission. We will just focus on platinum. So what we'll start to do is we'll start to buy individual Falcon 9s. We'll stack multiple vehicles on them. In fact, about 28 will fit on a direct insertion Falcon 9 mission that we can do. Um, we can go out and we can mine this multiple times and, and choose multiple different asteroids. So we'll start to select new asteroids, understand them, and look at it from there. Then we'll start to look at other commodity metallic substances we can go after. Obviously, we have the precious metals on Earth or the rare Earth elements we can go after, the precious metals we can go after. The reality is, though, Mo, is we have a lot of understanding about PGMs, how to detect them, how to go get them. I would be lying to you if I said I knew like of a gold asteroid. I don't, right? So we're not sure on some of these higher market cap precious metals if they really exist at the concentrations that make mining them in space viable. Um, we don't have that. We do have it for some of the rare earth elements. But, you know, keep in mind from an economic standpoint, those market caps are going to be a lot smaller. And so it's not like you could send, you know, a thousand missions to them each year. Like they can't just support that much. But it's really going to depend on how this goes long term. Um, I will say when we really talk about the 50 year game plan of Astroforge, we're all seeing things like copper, um, lithium, all of these elements are becoming much more expensive. And that has to do with their environmental impacts as well as their impact to be mined. The environmental impacts of mining are not something to put by the wayside. You know, 28% of global emissions can be estimated to be caused by just mining the earth. Long-term goal of Astroforge is to get all that shit off the planet. There's no reason for us to be doing that there. We know all of this stuff exists in space. Like Once it hits a certain inflection point in price, and that price may be dictated by both the commodity price and the environmental damage associated with it, it makes a lot of sense to move all of this off-world. We just got to prove it out first with something that's worth a lot of money and show people you can actually fucking do it. Now, uh, and you don't have to give me an exact number, especially if you haven't talked about this publicly, nor, if you, nor, nor do you want to, but... Can you give me a scale of like how much capital will be required ultimately to be able to pull off a like land on the land on an asteroid, come back safely, um, and maybe you can you, you can utilize other types of missions as as, as sort of like a, a relative kind of benchmark? But are we talking you know, hundreds of millions of dollars? Are we talking tens of millions of dollars? Are we talking any type of number that's you know closer to? Yeah, higher than that, and you know the kind of R and D development costs ultimately. Like, how, like how, how how large of a how capital intensive is this ultimately? Yeah, so I, I don't want to get into direct numbers, but I will say a couple of things here. Number one, I will say it's uh, we have estimated this from day one of the company, and to my surprise, we are still tracking to it. Um, I will also tell you that we are fucking wrong. Uh, anybody that's ever worked in space before has had an estimate of what it's going to cost to build X, and you're wrong. And I'm not going to try to kid anybody and say we're not. Uh, we do not think this is a billion dollars to do at all. We actually think this is very, very easily reachable uh, with our current funding. It can be augmented. Um, we see a totally viable path to make this happen for very, very low cost from a complete amount of capital needed to be raised. That all being said, Mo, like space is fucking hard. Shit happens. Rockets blow up. You lose spacecraft. You, you know, you make mistakes along the way. And like those mistakes are going to be more expensive than I think a classic startup running them. Like, you make a mistake at your latest and greatest AI company, like you just, you know, reset your H100s and you're good to go. We make a mistake like, well, we got to buy another launch. We got to wait another year. We got to build another spacecraft. Like the mistakes right. are very, very costly. And we are running a high risk mission here. Keep in mind, these, these vehicles we're building are going to be, you know, measured in the millions of dollars, not measured in the billions of dollars like some of these other classical ones. And that intuitively means we are taking much higher risk on these missions. We will have failures. And, uh, you know, we have a plan in place for how to deal with every single one of those failures. In fact, it's a little crazy to look at. We have over 60 identified for our first three missions that we are tracking and saying, like, well, what happens if this happens? What happens? You know, thinking about how we can shift milestones, all of this kind of stuff. It's a very complex process to think through all of the failure cases here. And 
the reality is when one happens, which it will, we're going to have to just choose the best plan at the time and move forward yeah. and, and do our best to close the gap. How do you, how do you think about team construction, right? Cause you're not necessarily just looking for space people here. You know, you're looking for folks that have experience mining or am I wrong? Like, how do you think about, uh, as you, as you sort of, you, as you and Jose have built out the initial team, um, what are the types of skill sets that you've been looking for? And, you know, what are you continuously looking for kind of going forward? Yeah, I mean, we hire things like physicists who have never touched a spacecraft in their life, right? Or just across the board, you're going to hire from very, very different backgrounds. This isn't a rocket company. So, you know, you can't just hire everybody from SpaceX or Virgin or Relativity to build it up. We have a couple space people here, but we also have a lot of people that are not. And so when we think about team construction, we think really about two things. Number one, you, you got to really be top notch. And I think this goes for any startup. Like you got to hire the best of the best. And if you're not, like you're already going to be on the wrong foot. And then number two is, we also want fucking doers. We want people who aren't scared to get their hands dirty and build it. I don't care if you're a physicist out of the best college in the world. You better be able to build the fucking refinery. And then on top of that, you better be able to build it and get it ready for space. And that's a challenge to a, a lot of people. I mean, to be clear, mission number one was a big challenge to our company. But it was very important to me that we went to space, that we weren't, you know, we were a space company that actually launched right away, even if we failed. Because you have to teach kind of a new, br- uh, a new team or someone that's not used to dealing with spacecraft and how hard it is and how difficult these launches are. You have to teach them what it's all about. And I'd rather do that on the cheap vehicle than on the expensive one. So that's right. what we did. Are there, are there uh, other companies um, that are trying to do this today? Yeah, there's a couple out there. There's a couple other companies that are out there trying to do it um, and go after it. Now, I think you still have some companies going after water. You still have some companies going after kind of different materials or building habitats. I want to be very clear about something about Astroforge, which I I hopefully takes this a little bit. You know, you brought this up like people think of asteroid mining as very sci-fi. And I think they think of it as sci-fi because of what you see. You see people go out and like mine the universe to like build space stations or build shit in space. And like none of that has ever made any fucking sense to me. Mm -hmm. I think we are a true deep tech company where all of our risk is front loaded. We have a lot of technical risk that we got to prove. There is no back end risk to this custom uh, to this to this company. There is no customer acquisition cost or risk associated with like we sell a fucking commodity on the market. That is all we're doing. Um, we're not trying to go mine water and hopeful that like a rocket will refuel one day with our refueling point or we can make rocket fuel. Like we're building a company to benefit Earth, and that is it. All right. Well, let's 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 talk uh, a little bit about the the regulatory side of all this, right? Legal regulatory side. So there is a, uh, you know, there's not a lot of <laughs> laws, right? There's like a bunch of these treaties out there that are loosely followed, but not re- really. The closest thing I found was like the Outer, Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which effectively prohibits nations from going to celestial bodies and claiming it as their own, right? Now, that's not what you're doing here. But, um, you know, and it doesn't, it clear, clearly does not um, address the question of commercial resource extraction. Uh, but is this is this an issue? Is this something? Um, how, how do you think about the regulatory environment today? And what do you think? Where do you think it goes? Like, because if you are successful and you are bringing back, you know, millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars worth of platinum, and you're selling it in market, you know, people are going to start asking questions, right? There's no doubt. So, how do you think about that? This is where I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Planetary Resources. The 2015 Space Act that they got passed clearly states a commercial company can go mine a fucking asteroid. So, like, it's not a question to us. Now, let's be honest about a couple of things here. As soon as we go mine an asteroid, governments will become interested and we will have regulation put in place. It's like, you know, when the Wright brothers flew a plane, there wasn't any FAA. Now, if they try to go do that, they'd have to file like 80 different certificates, right? And get all this, like, it's how the world works. But it does clearly say in the 2015 Space Act, we can go mine an asteroid um, and we can do this commercially and bring it back. So we don't really have a concern with how we go about it on the first couple missions. I think it is something we have talked to the State Department about. We will continue to have conversations about. Hopefully, we will lead that regulation going forward in the future. And I do think to some extent, you got to be a little bit cautious here, right? You don't want people kind of being destructive to these things or putting them on any kind of weird courses or realistically, that's why I always kind of like get a little bit concerned when people tell me like, oh, my idea is to bring back, you know, a hundred megaton asteroid and put it in low earth orbit. I'm like, that's probably a really stupid idea because if you fuck that up, like that's a little bit of a problem for the planet. So, you know, there's going to be some regulation put in place here. Uh, But as of right now, uh, it's smooth sailing and we believe we're good to go. So, you know, I mean, well, maybe in payload, you'll cover us one day and be like, oh, Astroford mission scrub because the DOD came in and told these guys to get off the rocket. (laughs) Hopefully not though. We don't think that's, that's on the horizon yet. 
Why not uh, think about like uh, non-asteroid bodies, right? Why not like the moon? Is there a reason why, or is, is that on the roadmap? Are you thinking about that? Because there's there are there are resources on the moon that I know are worth a lot of money here on on Earth. Um, any reason so why that wasn't on the there's roadmap? There's not. I guess I will challenge that and say I don't think there actually is. The moon's kind of lame. Like, okay. don't get me wrong. People are going to go colonize the moon, and we're going to have the Artemis Accords and all this kind of stuff going up. That's all great, but like. If I had moon dust at my house, like I could sell it as a collector's item. Like there's no, there's very little platinum in it. There's very little gold that we've ever detected. Like there's some water on the moon. Like if I bring back water, are you going to buy a lunar water bottle? Right. Like I'll pay an extra dollar for Fiji water. I don't think I'm going to pay an extra dollar for moon water. Um, <laughs> you know, as we go forward, like there really just isn't a commercial use case for the moon. There is absolutely a government use case for the moon. But again, I'm not a government focused company. We're not super interested in it. Uh, we're interested in being a completely commercially viable company. And the only way we think to do that is through commodity resources. No, that's a, that's a fair point. We're, we're, we, we are actually, um, and, and here's where I have to be very careful. We are going to have a guest on the show later this year. That's going to challenge your point there on, on, on resource extraction on the moon. So we'll have to get you guys in a room together one day and, and, and duke it out. Cause I'm, I'm as long I mean, don't get me wrong. If he tells me that, um, if he can tell me that the government will pay me X amount of dollars for X amount of resource on the moon, great. I'll go mine the moon, but that's not how government works right now. I mean, right. the, NASA right. does not have a contract that says if you go mine lunar regolith, we'll give you, you know, a thousand dollars per kilogram. Like that's sure. not a thing. So sure, sure. I would just say like, I hope it happens. Uh, and I think there's a lot of companies, especially with the Artemis Accords going after this for us, it's not attractive. It just doesn't right. make economic sense right now. And I can't truthfully tell anybody in a commercial sense that me bringing back moon dust actually has a high enough market cap that can support a company. Fair enough, fair enough. So uh, uh, you alluded to uh, this a, a little bit in terms of like what, you know, Astro Forge looks like in, in 30 to 50 years, but maybe let's just talk 10 years, right? What does what the business look like in 10 years? Let's assume everything has gone on gone well, you've you know, hit sort of your, 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 your expected milestones. Uh, 10 years from now, you know, what is Astro Forge going to be doing? Yeah, I think 10 years from now, once we've successfully mined an asteroid, like that's when we will fully vertically integrate the company. We'll bring everything in house. We'll be producing mining vehicles and running operations in deep space consistently. And, uh, you know, for me, it would be some of those other things that we still have to explore. So hopefully Jose doesn't kill me for saying this, but I would love to build like a competitor to DSN, right? And have a way to talk to these things without leasing giant ass telescopes from the government, or I'm sorry, satellite dishes from the government and kind of like building up that whole private commercial deep space infrastructure. I think it's really where I see Astroforge going in the next 10 years. Um, and then hopefully helping out kind of the next generation of people that want to push the envelope with our already in place infrastructure as we grow on it. So as someone who uh, knows a lot about mining, I've been actually, this is probably the one question I've been dying to ask um, all, uh, I'll show. Uh, how unrealistic is Armageddon? Um, we have an asteroid coming, 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 <sighs> Uh, yeah, on, I just watched Earth's it like trajectory. a week ago. I just watched it like a week ago, with my son. And the reality is, like, I don't want to crush anybody's dreams. Like, it's a fucking awesome movie, right? I got <laughs> nothing, man. You got Bruce Willis. You got you, can, you got Ben Affleck. Like, dude, if I'm gonna send some guys to an asteroid, that's what I'm gonna pick. But let's be honest about it. like, yeah, it makes no fucking sense. But that's Hollywood, right? None of these asteroid movies make any sense. That's what's fun about it. But I also I do have to say like. I also hate them all a little bit because it then becomes my job whenever I talk to somebody to convince them that we're not batshit crazy and going like, oh yeah, we're going to build a six you know trillion dollar spacecraft and try to reproduce Armageddon. Like, there's no commercial viability to that. So they've kind of they've kind of killed my uh, my investor pitches had to change because of those those moves. Have you actually gotten folks that brought up Armageddon in, in, in investor pitches? Like fifty percent. <laughs> it's probably uh, that a high mo and i'm like can you guys please just not bring this up anymore like, I, I get it uh, but that you know. is, that's pretty funny actually that's pretty funny <laughs> nobody brings up the other one i guess armageddon's the only one that really stuck there was a couple movies during that time period that went about it uh that showed about asteroids you know and seemed like i get brought up with don't look up at least that was at the beginning that movie's kind of faded oh, already yeah yeah, yeah. Don't so, look up. that's yeah i think armageddon is just so iconic um I think what there's deep impact, but I don't think there was any there was any like mining or any asteroid drilling that took took place. But yeah, uh, Armageddon, man, what a great movie! Um, so <laughs> uh, I hate I, yeah I hate I hate to uh, I hate to bring up a sore subject since it sounds like you you have to answer that question quite quite often. So uh, so taking a step away from from just kind of mining specifically, uh, Matt, uh, just kind of curious, like 
what are what are sort of the the big tech innovations in the industry that you foresee happening over the next um, over the next I don't know, few years or next kind of five to ten years? And then and, and is there anything? I mean, and you're welcome to tie it back to mining. Is there anything that doesn't exist today that you think will exist um, and will make the lives or make what you're doing in Master Report easier? Like, what are the types of technologies out there? Maybe that doesn't exist today that. Yeah, there's there's really one key technology that doesn't exist today or doesn't exist today in a way that is actually accessible that I think will really, really help us. Now, it's not required. And if it's a total failure, like we we still have an economically viable business case, but that is simply heavy launch. Like mm-hmm. we have New Glenn coming online. We have Starship hopefully coming online. We have Terran R hopefully coming online. And if all those, we have three competitors building these heavy launch. What does that mean for people like me? It means launch gets cheaper. Um, yeah. And even cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And one of our biggest costs every mission is still launch, even though we have the clips program, even though we're two orders of magnitude less than even, you know, a decade and a half ago, it's still one of the highest line items we've got. So I'm hopeful that that will come online and make it, make it cheaper. From Astroforge's standpoint, there's no technology that has to be developed at this point for us to be successful. It's all execution risk and, and how much we can execute and actually pull these missions off. I'm not a good predictor of the future. I've been terrible about this. You can look at my stock portfolio and see that my prediction of the future is garbage. So I'm going to hold off on making any predictions of the future. I will say this, though. There is a ton of really fucking awesome space startups out there, and I hope that they can all be successful. And I think, you know, there's a couple of them out there that really have a chance to change our way of life if they can pull it off. And so I'm at least rooting for all of them. Um, I hope they're successful, and I hope we can really, you know, this new generation of entrepreneurs can can do something just, I think that's really fucking cool. It's not B2B SaaS. And that's like a big bonus to someone like me because that's kind of boring. So as, as a YC backed company, are there other, uh, you know, give me at least another YC space company that you're, uh, you're particularly rooting for, you're excited about? I mean, actually the one I'm super excited about, which is, ugh, I can't, I got to take a step back, Mo. I can't say it because then I'm already going to counteract what I just said. All right. Let's, 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 well, you, you can also I'm going to say, I'm going to say it. It doesn't have to be why I see it. You can go beyond maybe just the space, space industry in general. Any other startups out there that you're ex- particularly excited about? I mean, I, I'm particularly excited about quite a bunch, uh, uh, quite a lot of them. So I can go through a couple lists. Um, I love what K2 Space is doing. And if they can pull off building these giant kind of cheap satellites, I think that's fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. I love a company like Apex that is trying to just make a manufacturing line of these satellites because we've had that problem. Every vendor we talk to, right, it's kind of a one-off. And so if they can pull that off, that's awesome. can even go as far as talking about companies like Varda that are taking giant stabs like we are and trying to bring, you know, manufacturing off-world to some extent. And like, if they can do that, what a fundamental change for our way of life. Um, all the way down to even some of the more, um, and I hope she doesn't kill me for this, some of the more like boring space companies like that, that are really solving a fundamental problem that every space company has. And that's a company like Epsilon 3, who's, you know, just actually executing on something that like fundamentally has actually changed our business and made it much better than how we were doing all of these kind of processes before. Like those companies really have to exist to make all of this happen at a process that makes sense. Um, and so across the board, you kind of have this little ecosystem that if everybody can pull it off, like it just really changes our way of life. I don't think Laura will be, uh, will be mad at that. <laughs> I think mean, she's look, it's, uh, it's sometimes it's the most, uh, you know, it's automating or making the most mundane things, uh, more efficient where you can unlock the most value. Right. So, uh, and she's great. She's an early supporter of payload. So we, we, we love, we love Laura over here. So she's uh, been a huge uh, supporter of us. And like, again, Epsilon three is actually one of the pieces of software that has fundamentally changed the way we do business. And I mean, even though it's just a piece of software, right? Like it has really changed our our processes and I think made us better much earlier than than I've ever been in the past. Right, right. Well, Matt, this has been a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining. I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, excited to get you back on the show once you've uh, brought some platinum back, back to earth. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Mo. All right, thanks.